this year, the unimaginable happened. As the coronavirus began spreading rapidly across the world, lockdowns imposed by our governments took us by surprise. For many LGBTI people, this brought new and extreme challenges, or exacerbated challenges that they were already facing. For many LGBTI organizations, the lockdowns meant adapting their work to provide for basic needs like food, housing, and medicines, and putting a lot of their more strategic work on hold. Many of us didn't experience this equally. Uh, some of us experience it in a way, okay, I will watch Netflix and read books and learn Italian. But some of us had a very hard time and were on the edge of the existence. And my organization, Association Spectra, is uh, having a social services program. It's called Community Building Program. Uh, in any times, regardless of this crisis. But during the COVID-19 crisis, we have reprogrammed uh, a lot, adjusting that program to the current needs of the community. So for example, our social services, which include self-support group and peer consultations, now uh, were, were reprogrammed in regards to transferring to online space. Also, cooperation with our allies, Queer Montenegro, NGO Juventus, and NGO Stana, which is an organization of LBT women. With our joint forces, we uh, provided support in the terms of food, shelter, paying utilities, preventing homelessness, paying uh, medications, and stuff like that to our community members. So it did impact our advocacy, but also we are developing different kinds of strategies on how to approach uh, these issues. We are doing a lot of advocacy, which is not very visible, and we are also nurturing our connections, uh, especially with international partners and also within the state, so that we can continue smoothly as we can. Not only did LGBTI organizations find themselves adapting their work towards service provision, but a core of their political work and community organizing, their annual pride protests and celebrations, had to move online, while vulnerable prides came under further threat from opposing forces. The freedom to assembly uh, was pretty much during the lockdown um, completely taken away from people. So you could really see that the repression to any kind of attempt to express, you know, political disagreement, it was very severe in that sense, you know, very much trying to discourage and punish people who try to voice themselves that way. For us, um, organizing a protest was actually not um, allowed. The penalty, if you go against uh, these uh, decrease for, you know, health crisis, uh, go up to 100,000 euros for the organization and go up to 14,000 euros for the responsible representative of the organization. And then one week before the Pride, we had a first meeting with the chief police you know, officer here for Ljubljana city center. And he was saying, oh, but you know, there's also other protests now and they're getting the permits from the Health Institute. And so we started to reapply the, this specific health-related permit to the National Institute. So our pride was last Saturday, the 26th, and we didn't get the permit until Wednesday afternoon. I think still next year it's going to be heavily influenced by everything. And, and no matter if, you know, the best possible scenarios actually um, happen, I think our community will have been affected deeply and severely um, and, and we will have to deal with that. It is incredible to see how quickly our movements have shifted gears in recent months. Um, not only we've learned how to work effectively online, um, more importantly, I think our movements have stood up to challenge the needs that our communities is facing, whether that is about providing safe space, whether that is about providing security protection, and in some cases that is about food, shelter, and other basic needs. Um, together with all of the challenges that uh, the movement has been facing in terms of making our voices heard, for many people within the LGBTI community uh, that are 
marginalized because of who they are, these challenges are very real and even sometimes more difficult. And so for the movement, that means that there is an important role to play in giving perspective and giving hope and um, creating a sense of direction, not just for ourselves, but also for the many community members that we, that we represent. Um, and so the question really is, how do we make sense of this complex world around us? And how do we create spaces where our communities and our movements can safely come together and think about the work that lies ahead of us? The COVID-19 crisis threw a harsh spotlight onto socioeconomic disparities that have always been present and which are rapidly growing as a result of the pandemic. It became very clear that particular communities are more adversely affected than others. In many countries, we have been seeing an increase in inequality, uh, especially since the economic crisis. We've seen like a huge increase in homelessness, for example, in many countries. We've seen uh, standards of living going down, not just for the LGBTI community, but for like most people with uh, more and more uh, reflection about this uh, economic divide. Because of COVID and the travel restriction and the lockdowns, most sex workers uh, lost their income or their main source of income. And most sex workers were not included in uh, any economic and social measures uh, by governments. So we saw a huge increase in uh, precarity, uh, in mental health, distress and anxiety. Many uh, sex workers have uh, committed suicide or tried to commit suicide, uh, particularly like LGBTI sex workers are often the most vulnerable. Many people will turn to other forms of uh, economic opportunity, including sex work. And by itself, it's not a problem. Anybody should be working in the sex industry if that's what they want to do. Well, simply put, the more people work in the sex industry, the lower the rates are and the more precarity there is, like with any other type of job. And I think it's important to reflect what we're going to do uh, as a community about the increasing poverty and precarity, the homelessness, etc., that will uh, be a consequence of the, the COVID crisis. In the middle of the lockdowns, the murder of George Floyd provided a tipping point for the Black Lives Matter movement, which in turn spotlighted other structural inequalities within the LGBTI movement and communities. I don't really understand why George Floyd was the tipping point. Uh, there's been many George Floyds before George Floyd. The status quo does not want us to have an honest conversation about racism. And also people are afraid of being vulnerable, which I totally understand. Um, but we need to be honest. We need to actually say things need to be stated. They need to be said. You can basically say, I don't have enough knowledge. I don't know enough. Uh, and then I can help you. And then we can have a conversation. We need to also address the fact that we do contribute and uphold power imbalances in and of ourselves. If you've had a sexist thought, then you've had a racist thought. Um, and just admitting that, just admitting that from the get-go will already help us move forward. It's a consistent question that you need to be asking yourself in your behaviour. What are you doing for Black lives? Do they matter? Question mark. COVID-19 highlighted in such a strong way all of the structural inequalities that exist in our societies around class, gender, race, that exist in our society, but also in our movement. And, and I think this is the moment where we really need to embrace this important challenge uh, and this important issue. What we can do to really meaningfully start addressing and overcoming structural inequalities is firstly be aware, and I think we are getting there, but mostly we need to start asking whose voices we're hearing and listening to and why and why not. Who are we making space for in our organizations, in our events, in our communities, and who is not part of what we do whose experiences and whose issues we're advocating for and we're speaking about and whose experience we're not yet talking about. But I think the main challenge, the main question we have to ask ourselves is how do we get into this place? How do we build our collective capacity to do this work for all of those who are currently um, marginalized? 
As 2020 progressed and the COVID-19 crisis deepened, we saw the further rise of populist forces in Europe. Politicians were willing and able to exploit the lockdowns in order to advance their own power agendas. And a key target was the scapegoating of LGBTI people and backsliding on their rights. I know that uh, sometimes from the Western perspective, it looks like everything uh, is quite good with LGBT rights in Europe, but actually it's not like that. And to be honest, the situation can turn, can turn and change and it can happen so fast. And also it makes me think about uh, our opponents. They are strong, they are uh, united. And even so, sometimes they have some political issues. They're actually taking a lot from each other. And I think that they act as a, I don't know, kind of uh, unified power. We can find lots of similarity uh, between Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, Andrei Duda, co chairs of AFD, Marine Le Pen, and the President Erdogan. Those leaders need both internal and ex external enemies in order to continue their power in their countries. And the LGBTI community is the, easy, is the easiest target as an internal enemy. What kind of human rights violations happening in one of those countries encourages the other one? Because hate is contagious as well as the courage is. The propaganda ban in Russia encouraged LGBTI free zones in Poland. And the LGBTI free zones in Poland encouraged the ban on gender studies and the change in the transition law in Hungary. What happens in Hungary, Russia and Poland also encourages LGBTI bans and human rights violations of LGBTI community in Turkey. Even though this pandemic is a global challenge, that's we have been true, this trans forms a bigger threat to human rights, democracy and EU values as the European Union is the last castle remained standing against human rights violators. At a time like this, when we see many governments trying to dismantle democratic structures and the rule of law, we need to more than ever again ask ourselves how we can be allies and leaders in these movements. And we need to at the same time ask ourselves how we can we always connect this fight very strongly um, to a fight for human rights and a real advancement of LGBTI people. We need to look again at our advocacy strategies. So when a traditional government um, targeted advocacy fails, who are other actors we need to work with together? Where are we actually sending our messages to and how we're we working together for LGBTI rights? The situation in, in many countries in our region is very worrying and backlash is very real. Um, but at the same time, I think the awareness of backlash has increased incredibly. And there's so many actors now, um, so many organizations that are not specifically working on LGBTI rights, um, governments, professional association, businesses who increasingly are coming to us and are asking how they can be part of working against the backlash and how they can help to defend LGBTI rights. And I think as a movement, we need to, to think strategically um, together with them of how we can work forward together, how we can really use all the different fears, all the different instruments these actors bring to the table um, strategically in fighting for a better protection of LGBTI rights. 2020 has been a year of unprecedented change for the world and for LGBTI organizations and activists. So many questions about how we work into the future have been raised. But one thing is clear above all. Now and in the times ahead, we need each other. We all feel this deep need for solidarity, for being connected, for knowing that we're not alone in these troubled times. We need the gathering more than ever because we do need more than ever to bring our collective wisdom, creativity, thinking together to think through how we continue to make change happen. And we need to come together because we need inspiration. We need inspiration and learning from each other.